verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives to their own husbands be subject in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. My antivirus is telling me this. Okay, there we go. Gave himself for her. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water of the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. We love our bodies, eh? He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, Paul says, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love your own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Amen. Thank you, Father, for your word. You know, if you go back to Genesis, um, I just want to kind of look where Paul is coming from. You know, Paul was a Pharisee before he met Jesus. You know that? Who didn't know that? Okay, you all know that, so I'm preaching to the converted. So Paul, Paul's context in his mind was God's creation. He was grounded in the scriptures. And so if you go back to Genesis, um, we, we look at uh, what God, how God created people. He created everything. He created the animals, the plants, the earth, everything. He created the sun and the moon, and then he created people. And then what did he do? He put people in a garden. What is a garden? A garden is a boundary in which you tend the plants and make sure everything is free from pests and weeds. Kind of like what we see here. If any of you have green fingers, who has green fingers? Who likes their garden? I know Alma does, but there are a couple of others. Okay, in your garden, you put stones around it, you, you, you turn up the soil, you plant seeds, you put flowers there, you see these lovely flowers growing here, you pull out the weeds, and marriage is supposed to function inside the boundaries of God's garden. Do you know that? There are boundaries, there's a way we're supposed to live in our marriages. And the garden that I'm talking about is God's boundaries. Our marriages in the confines of God's boundaries are supposed to be awe-inspiring. Did you know that? When people look at our marriages, they should go, wow, that's amazing. Our marriages as Christians, we're supposed to glorify God with our marriages. And I think... If you look at, um, at verse 32 of chapter 5, I think that's what what's Paul, Paul is getting at. Paul says, he says, uh, the marriage re- relationship between a husband and a wife should reflect the relationship between Jesus and the church. In other words, our marriages are a living witness of the gospel. So that's what we want to talk about this morning. Our marriages are a living witness of the gospel. The mission of the Christian marriage is to declare, declare, I'm struggling to read my own words, the gospel to demonstrate the love of Christ and his relationship to his bride. Amen? Do you agree? So how does this marriage relationship declare the gospel? 
And how does it show a picture of Christ in the church, I wonder? And um, I'm going to ask my lovely wife. I think you look so beautiful this morning. Thank you, my love. <laughs> we think so. <laughs> um, well done. Thank you. Um, so how do our marriages reflect this picture that Paul is speaking about? What does it look like? And so this morning we're going to look at the scriptures and we're also going to use some examples from our own lives to try and explain it. And hopefully our marriage um, shows something of this picture. So by the way, on Friday, we, uh, it was our anniversary. We've been married for 22 years. So that's, um, that's long for some, but for, for others in this church, that's just like a, a little drop in the ocean. So we're very honored to be around people, and we have examples around us in this fellowship of people who've been married for many, many years. And that is such a blessing. Um, I think it's quite a rare thing. I was saying to Dion, if you take a cross-section of society, this is not a usual um, percentage. So we've, we're very grateful and honored to have these kinds of marriages among us. And those of us who are younger should take advantage of that. But let me get to the scriptures. Okay, I've got the wonderful part to speak about this morning, about submission and headship. Um, and I know some of you ladies are here specifically because you want to know. <laughs> In fact, I spoke to one of the younger men last week and I said, yeah, when we speak about marriage, like I know what you want to know. You want to know about submission, right? He's like, yes. Because <laughs> um, I think it's so often misunderstood. Um, okay, so I have the, these first portions of the scripture to cover submitting to one another in the fear of God wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord for the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body therefore just as the church is subject to Christ so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything so what is submission in the context of marriage and these scriptures. I like the way Paul says, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And I think before we can do any kind of submitting to anyone, um, we need to be in submission to our Lord, right? Because this is a beautiful thing. And this is in the context of showing a picture um, of what the church looks like. And it's, it's actually our worship to honor God this way by, by living like this. And so let's look at some passages of scripture. First of all, submission means to respect your husband. In verse 33, it says, let the wife see that she respects her husband. 1 Peter 3 verse 2 says, respectful and pure conduct of a wife. Respectful and pure conduct. And the Amplified Version gives a bit of a wider description of what this means. It's um, 1 Peter 3 verse 2 speaks about a wife um, who is reverencing her husband and it, it explains it like this. It means to respect, to defer to, to revere him, to honor, esteem, appreciate, prize, and in the human sense, to adore him. That is to admire, praise, be devoted to, deeply love, and enjoy your husband. I'm sure all the husbands in here want to give a shout, right? <laughs> this does not mean to belittle or constantly quarrel with or oppose your spouse. But it also doesn't mean that you don't have a voice or that you're inferior. It's a choice to love him and place him above others in your life, not above Christ, but above others. 
The second point, submission involves love. Titus 2 verse 4 says that the older women are to train the younger women to love their husbands. And what is love? 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8 tells us, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. This is how wives are to treat their husbands. Is this a different picture of how any of us should treat each other? No. It's basic Christianity. I always say Christianity 101, that's marriage. Learning to love, learning to forgive. Um, so part of a wife um, loving her husband is also wanting to please him. 1 Corinthians 7, 34 says that the married woman should be careful um, about how to please her husband. So this is all around this marriage relationship of a wife and a husband and what submission means. Okay, it means to respect, it means to love. It also involves obedience. Now, I, I never used to enjoy this scripture. <laughs> In fact, it's still a little bit hard, but let me go through it. And then let me just give you the full context and the understanding as far as I understand it. Um, 1 Peter 3, verse 5 and 6 says this, and I used to really like to skip over this. This is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children. <laughs> if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening, now the word obey there means to hear under as a subordinate, that is to listen to attentively or to heed. Note, this does not mean that the wife is subordinate. Okay, the wife is not inferior. God made us um, in his own image and likeness. Women have um, immense value and worth and we are not lower than men. Um, we are equal in God's eyes. We are all human beings, okay? Um. <laughs> yes, you can. Just a comment. Uh, if you read Genesis, you see men are made of dirt and women are made of flesh. Just a comment. What are you saying? I'm saying that you, I esteem you, my love. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I've never heard that one before. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so this is about an attitude of a wife towards her husband. And remember, this is a picture of Christ and the church. It's our worship to honor God and to honor each other. And in the marriage, you know, we, we share the closest relationship of any human beings on the planet in a marriage because as Dion's going to share just now, we become one flesh. And when you get married, there's no room for selfishness. Amen. That's why it's so hard, especially at the beginning. And we have to learn to be selfless. And so to choose to subordinate yourself, to choose to honor, to choose to submit to someone, it's, it's, a, it's an act of worship to God, um, and it's a picture of the church. And um, just a few notes. This obedience doesn't apply in matters that are contrary to the word. So if the husband is telling the wife something, to do something that's sinful or um, that's ungodly, it doesn't apply there, okay? Um, it also doesn't apply in abusive situations. This, the context of submission is love. As you'll see just now, it's how the, the husband treats the wife like Christ treated the church and gave his life for her. So the context here is perfect love and pure love. And this is an ideal. And I know that we, the world we live in, we are 
broken people and there's a broken system. And so we don't always see this beautiful picture, but this is the ideal. This is the context in which these matters of submission and headship and, and all of these things work. They work in the context of love, God's kind of love. In the garden. In the garden, that's right, Dion. Um, so in the marriage relationship, as in all relationships, we are submit to one another in love. It's never to be exerted in dominance or control of one another, but offered freely. And the kind of submission referred to here with wives is actually very interesting. It's um, a type of submission that's serving and that's voluntary. And if we go back and look at those scriptures, um, verse 22, 21 and 22 of Ephesians chapter five, what's interesting that I discovered in the Greek language, there's actually not a full stop between verse 21 and verse 22, where it says submit to one another, and then it says wives, submit to your husbands. Um, it's actually one thought. In fact, the oldest Greek copies do not even have the word submit in verse 22. They borrow, it borrows the, the verb from verse 21. So the Greek literally says, submitting to one another in reverence for Christ, wives to your own husbands. In other words, when Paul tells wives to submit to their husbands, he refers to precisely the same kind of submitting all believers are to give one another. Isn't that interesting? We are to submit to one. This is how we, are, we ought to live in these kind of loving, honoring, respectful relationships. So this is not something that's foreign or should be foreign to us as Christians. And in the marriage, it's just a more intimate picture that we can give, showing this kind of love and respect. Um, and for those who, whose husbands are maybe not following God, there's also... Um, an advice or instruction that Peter gives in 1 Peter 3 because you might think okay my situation is not exactly the same because my spouse is maybe not following God following the word and in um, verse 1 it says this <clears throat> in like manner you married woman be submissive to your own husbands so that even if they do not obey the word of God they may be won over not by discussion, but by the godly lives of our wives, when they observe the pure and modest way in which you conduct yourselves. Um, that's what's gonna win them. And so this is something that we can do. It's an act of love, it's an act of worship, it's an act of service. It's a voluntary um, submitting of ourselves and actually showing Christ. And we need the Holy Spirit to live like this. This is not something that we can just do on our own. It comes out of knowing God, walking with Him, and allowing Him to help you and to shape you um, so that we can truly treat our spouses as God would have us treat them and show them the kind of honor and respect um, that they are due, that we are all due as human beings, actually. This is just like a, a, a picture. Um, so those of you, so I said that this submission is a serving submission. Those of you who might come to our house, I know Sally's often at our house and she sees me making Dion coffee all the time. <laughs> and so one of the things that I do that's part of our acts of love is that I make him coffee. So if I'm at home, it comes like every, sometimes I'll even get a little emoji sent to me if I'm working in another room and he's working in another room. <laughs> I'll get it, you know that little coffee cup? <laughs> I just get that, not even a word or anything, just <laughs> But it's something, it's just a little thing that I do, that I, it's an act of love and service. And so I make him coffee. Amen. And apparently it's the best tasting coffee. And all he has is black coffee, so I don't know how I can make it better than anyone else. But um, so it's, it's those kind of little things that count. Right, then the next, moving on to the next um, scripture, speaking about headship. For as the husband is head of the wife, as also, sorry, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. 
I brought that in to, so that you get that full context. So the word head here, where it says the husband is head of the wife. In the Greek, the head means, um, it's spoken of in the sense of seizing. The head as the most readily taken hold of, literally or figuratively, sorry, the part most readily taken hold of, literally or figuratively. Can so I, that sounds... Can I say something? Yes, you can. So, so the guys will know if you've ever been in a fight, you want to hit the guy in the head. <laughs> okay. So the, it's the easiest place to make contact with. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for that insight. Um, so it does sound like this is talking a bit like like a fight. It's the, the head is the part most readily taken hold of. And the way I understand headship, it's that the husband stands in front. He's first in line. Um, and so it's about order. Because we know, I mean the word tells us that we're not lower, we're not less than a husband and wife. There's just a way that God has put us together to operate in, a, in an order that works and that's honoring. And so the husband is the head. And so I honor Dion as the head of our home. Um, and in our home, we make decisions together, but I honor Dion as the head and I submit to him. That doesn't mean that I just go along with everything that he says. Um, we discuss matters and we decide on them together, but the responsibility lies with him. And in matters with our family, he's often the one that will address things. Um, you, know, you know, when it's like important things. So um, there, there is a situation that I experienced when we were younger, where this really kicked in, where I experienced this headship role. Um, I think it's really the only time I can really think where it kind of kicked in <laughs> big time, is that I was involved in an initiative um, with a group of people and I was kind of being taken advantage of and being misused and Dion saw this situation and he actually said to me I'm not going to allow it he stepped in and he put a stop to it and he went and addressed the people and he pulled me out and it was um, it was actually a very loving thing to do because he was right and so he exercised that role in our marriage um, he hasn't had to do that since. If he sees something, he lets me now stand on my own and deal with things. Um, but he's there to protect me and to watch over me. Um, and so that's how I understand it. And so he takes the blows. He takes the, the things that come. He stands in the front. So we, 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 in our marriage, we stand alongside each other, but he's in the front. Does that make sense? That's my understanding of headship. Um, and all of this operates in the environment of love. So I'm going to hand back to Dion. Okay, thank you. Um, so just, just to, as a point of interest for, for husbands and for future husbands, is um, if you're ever in a situation with your spouse and you feel like you need to dominate and put her in her place, then you're actually doing it wrong. Should I say that again? If you ever feel like you need to put your wife in her place, she's not submitting to you like she should. <laughs> I heard them. <laughs> You're actually doing it wrong. Okay. You're doing it wrong. So let me give you context. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Verse 25 says, Husbands, Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So what that verse is, it's an instruction with an example. Okay? Love her like Jesus loves the church and gave himself for her. He died for us. Jesus died on a cross for the church. He gave his life for us. God has no lower expectation from the husband in your marriage to give yourself for your wife. It's very easy to submit 
to somebody who's laid their life down for you. Did you know that? Um, Jennifer is more qualified than me in every area. Let me tell you that. She's cleverer than me. She's more educated than me. She's more eloquent than I am everywhere. But because I love her, because I choose to lay my life down for her, she happily submits to me because she knows that I want her greatest good. I want to protect her. I want to protect my kids, you know. I want to be the, the shield for my family. That's how it should be. So husbands, verse 28, ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. I don't know. Um, I'm sorry that I keep referring to, be, to fighting, okay? Forgive me. <laughs> Guys, generally, when they're younger, they get into fights sometimes, okay? And uh, I don't know if you've, the guys out there, has anyone ever taken a swing at you? Yeah. What happens automatically without even thinking? You retaliate. <laughs> it's, there's either a fight or flight response, okay? So if the guy's bigger than you, you run. Uh, if he's um, smaller than you, you give him a club. If he's your size, then there's a bit of a thought process that happens. But there's still an instant response. A, flight, a fight or flight response. What am I saying? I'm saying that we really know how to take care of ourselves. Guys know how to look after themselves. And the Bible says, Paul says, we must love our wives just like we're taking care of ourselves. And the only way I can think of doing that is throwing myself in the way. I used to say to John, um, he's not here today, but... Uh, when, when John and Hannah first left Abbotsford and they went to Sterling, they went to Sterling Primary, um, they were a little bit bullied at school. And John would come home very bleak. And, and in my mind, I knew that as a good Christian man, I couldn't, I didn't want to tell him, just make a fist and hit as hard as you can. The goal is to make him go down. I couldn't say that okay and so I would try to counsel him and in my mind the picture I had was just putting my arms around him and taking the blows for him can you see that picture you see somebody that maybe in the street being beaten and if you love them you'll run and you'll wrap yourself around them and let the person beat you instead that's what Jesus did for us on the cross. And that's what husbands should be doing for their wives and their families in the home. Amen. Can you see the picture? We love our wife as Christ loved the church. Even in the small things. I love rugby you know we watch rugby if Jennifer doesn't want to watch rugby I should prefer her if she wants to do something with me and I'm watching my favorite game I prefer her amen it's happened before she's like oh you're watching rugby today so no no I don't have to I'd like to, but I don't have to. I'd rather spend time with you. This is true. <laughs> Dion scores higher than me on preferring me over me preferring him. I must just say that. <laughs> if we're going on a date, she asks me, where do you want to go? I'll say to her, I want to go where you want to go. <laughs> Does this mean that I don't have a preference? No, it doesn't. What it does mean is that my wife is my preference. Amen? The Bible says that we are one flesh. Verse 31 says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. 
And Paul got this from Genesis, from the creation story where God speaks about the garden. And I'm not going to read the scripture. You can go read it yourself. Genesis 2 verse 18, 21 and to 24. Um, we go and read about the garden and Adam and Eve. And, and the Bible says, therefore, in verse 24 of Genesis chapter 2, it says, therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. In the Bible, one flesh means a union of love, devotion, and companionship. Amen? <laughs> In the Song of Solomon, there's a series of Hebrew love poems that describe the love relationship between a man and a woman. The book is originally written in Hebrew, uh, which has three different words for our one expression of the word love. And so I'd like to share that with you. Can I do that? So this, is, this I usually share. We've, I've married many young people that have been in our youth for over the years. I don't, I don't think it's up there. You're going to have to listen to what I have to say. Um, and so I usually use these three words at weddings. Okay, I think it's appropriate. So are you ready? The first Hebrew word is a word that is pronounced like this. Raya or rayo, okay? And uh, raya is the friendship, companionship part of love. It's, it's a, somebody you like to spend time with, okay? You should like to spend time with your wife or your husband. Have you ever heard somebody say, she's my best friend? You heard that? Or I can tell him anything. These are expressions of the word raya. Okay? You got it? This is the core of a marriage rela relationship. Companionship. The second word is ahaba. Which means deep affection. When, when you want to be with someone so much that your heart aches. Who's ever experienced that? Amen. Some guys are like, oh, I'm not going to put my hand up. <laughs> when your heart and mind are bent toward the one you love so intensely that you can't think of anything else. Okay? Have you ever thought like this? I would rather be here with her or with him right now than anywhere else. That's Ahaba. The lovers in Song of Solomon say that Ahaba is as strong as death. Many rivers cannot quench Ahaba. It is much more profound than fleeting romantic feelings or temporary urges. It is a decision to join your life to someone else that leads to commitment. Amen? Ecclesiastes 4 verse 12 says a threefold cord is not easily broken. So we've looked at one cord. We've looked at the second cord. Now I'm going to give you the third cord. Okay. Forgive me if I make you blush. The third word for love is a word called dode. Okay. Which means to carouse, rock, or fondle, or boil. Dode is, <laughs> I said that very quickly, so I'd just get it out of the way. Dode is the sexual element of a relationship. The lover in Song of Solomon says, kiss me with the kisses of your mouth, for your dode is more delightful than wine. Amen? It's in the Bible. <laughs> It's in the Bible. When a man and woman come together, God's intention is that these elements are combined in our marriages. When Jesus talks about the love relationship between a husband and a wife, he describes it with the term one flesh. One flesh, flesh is much more than just a physical act. 
It is the coming together of two people, emotions, hearts, minds, and experiences, and we become one. One, not two. You know, the, did you notice the Bible it doesn't say we become one spirit or one in mind? It says we become one flesh, one body together. Okay, that looks like something I didn't put there. <laughs> but I agree with it. Did you write that? <laughs> we are one and live like that. We share everything and we stand together. If under pressure, oh, is that for you? That's what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> Glitches again. <laughs> so I you think... Now? This, it says Jen in the front. <laughs> it's what happens when you share notes and then you add in and so forth. Um, I think this aspect of understanding that we are one has been the strength of our marriage. We often say it. We say it. We are one. Um, we are individuals and we operate in our own capacity, but... We recognize very well that we are one, we're a unit, and we stand together. We share a bed, we share a bank account, we share the raising of our children who are now grown. Um, we share household chores. Dion is our primary dishwasher in our house. Amen. He's also the preferred cook, but he doesn't cook as much as I do. But we share these responsibilities, um, and we are one. We see our marriage as, as one. Um, and, you know, if we are under pressure, we cling to one another. Um, we don't turn on one another. We turn towards one another. Um, and we've, been, we've experienced some things, some difficult things in the past in various pressure. different aspects of our lives where we've come under pressure or come under like attack and we've learned to to stick together we stand together we pray together we fight together we cry together um, we are honest with each other and we try to live in agreement that isn't that is a, a work in progress I think in all marriages um, but we try to live in agreement with each other and if we are out of sorts I always say that you know a marriage in unity and in agreement in harmony is like a safe harbor it's a peaceful place but I know if we are out of sync with each other it doesn't happen much anymore ever actually because we work on this if we are out of sync I am I'm out of sync um it feels like we are in the rough seas not in the safe harbor and so we have learned we make it our aim that if we have disagreement or something's happened like we sort it out quickly because we know that the enemy also takes advantage of situations like that and so we have a little competition to see who is going to say sorry first sorry my love i don't know i don't I know who wins the most on that one I'm sorry. But even if your flesh is like going, I don't want to say sorry, we do because we realize that if we're out of sorts, we're both in the wrong. And so rather just say sorry, even if you know you're not wrong. <laughs> That's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> but there's a bit of truth in it. It's better to be in agreement and to figure it out. Then you talk. And be honest we've learned from early early on in our marriage because we came in two not very perfect people and so we had to talk a lot and be honest a lot and I, I had a bit of an inferiority kind of complex um, and so I used to often think wrong about things so we had to talk it out so even if it comes out and it's a little bit ugly we, we've learned to be honest and open and so we talk and share and cry and pray and we stay in unity as much as we can um, so I just wanted to share that practically how it works um, in our home over to you 
Thank you, my love. Sorry if I've said anything wrong. <laughs> this is real, eh? Marriage is a real thing. You know, we, we can't have a disagreement like a, like a couple that's not married. We fight and off we go in different directions. It's not going to work like that. And um, just before I, I carry on, like, for, for guys, for husbands, if you've got daughters, um, you want them to marry a good guy. A guy that's going to put them first. A guy that's going to lay his life down for them. And how are they going to recognize that guy if you're not that guy? This thing is so important. Eh? You know, children don't listen to your words. They, they look at your example and they follow your example. And so if you want your daughters to marry good men that are selfless men, that's who you need to be. Amen? The same with wives. If you want your sons to marry good women who honor God with their lives, you need to set an example. And that's what it's all about. That's actually what Paul is getting at in this whole thing. Verse 32, he says, This is a great mystery, but I'm speaking about Christ and the church. So when people look at our marriage as Christians, when they see the unity, the oneness in our marriage, it should be telling a story. It should be telling the gospel story about Jesus and the church. They should see Christ laying his life down for the church and the church submitting to him. Because what else do we do with such a great love? Amen? Amen. What else can we do? The mission of our marriage in loving one another is the gospel. What about those who are struggling in their marriage? What about those that have been through a divorce maybe? God is our healer. He's our restorer. You know, you can only work where you are right now. If you've been through a divorce and you've been remarried, you need to learn to put the past behind you and focus on now. God is not dredging up the past. Amen? He loves you. And we all make mistakes. You know what the beauty of the gospel is? There's only one perfect one. And he died on a cross. The rest of us are all broken. And we all need his grace. Amen? A solid marriage is built on the premise that Christ is first in our relationship. Which means we follow Christ with respect to our spouse for their greater good. What about those who are single? You're married to the Lord. <laughs> you're one with him. Amen. Serve him wholeheartedly. Trust him for a godly spouse, just like your parents are doing. Amen. Remember the garden. <sighs> Do you remember the garden? God's boundaries. Let's strive to build our lives in the garden and not outside of the garden. Jesus' cross invites us back into the garden to live within God's boundaries. Amen? So I want to just make three calls this morning. If you're married and you want to make a, com a commitment to live in this one flesh relationship the way God intended, I'd like to ask that you take the hand of your spouse right now. Take, take their hand. 
Remember, I'm talking to married couples. Take their hand. Look into their eyes. Look into their eyes. And tell them in your own words, I love you. I'm committed to you. And I want to do this God's way. May we be one. Can you do that? I'll give you a minute. Take, your, take their hand, look into their eyes and commit yourself to them. Singles, don't hold anyone's hand. <laughs> Amen. We want to trust God with you to find a God-fearing partner so that your future relationships reflect the gospel. Get yourself connected by being part of a community group, a family. We are a church, we are a community of smaller communities. And the best way to find your partner is among people. Amen? That's how I found Jennifer and she found me. We were in a community. And I saw this beautiful woman. The one day... <laughs> With, she had hair done. <laughs> she was dressed all in white. <laughs> and I looked and I thought, yo, she's so beautiful. And from that day on, I started to pursue her. But it happened in the church. You know, it's okay to be attracted to somebody in the church as long as you're not sinning. Amen. Not an, it's not wrong to think somebody's beautiful or somebody's handsome. It's not wrong. Okay, so... Somebody's trying to stop me. Have I taken too long? Okay. Um, so if they're broken relationships... What we want to do is after the service, if you want prayer, I would like to invite you to come and join us up front. And somebody will be here and we'll pray for you. But before we get there, if you're not a Christian, Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What is he saying? He's saying without the Spirit of God, we cannot live this life that I'm talking about. We cannot live this way without the Spirit of God. We are all lost and blind in our sin without Christ. The good news is that Jesus died on a cross for you and me. He took the penalty of our sin so that we can freely follow Him. Amen? And He calls each one of us to repent, to put your trust in Him believe in him and be born again by receiving his spirit if you've never surrendered your life to Christ maybe you've lived as a Christian but you've never repented of your sin and received the Holy Spirit and been born again if that's you then I want to ask you to do one three things okay three things you've heard me do this before first I'd like to pray a prayer with you okay Second, if you pray the prayer with me, I'm going to ask you to show me who you are by raising your hand. And lastly, if you pray and raise your hand, I'm going to call you up to the front so that you, somebody can connect with you and you can become part of a community group. Is that okay? Is that all right? Okay, so can I have everybody close your eyes, please? And if this is for you, please pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I am a sinner and I'm separated from you because of my sin. But you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for all who repent and place their trust in you. Thank you for sending your Son. Lord Jesus, today, the 29th of May 2022 I repent I turn away from my sin and my own way and I turn to you to trust
trust you, to follow you, and to obey you with my life. Please place your spirit in me as you promised you would to all those who trust in you. Amen.